finishing up our study today on the book of Job, um, the whole purpose of man, what is our purpose? We found that there's a number of truths, so many in the book of Job, and we see even some other just really good principles and other good truths and other things as we read here in a few moments um, when we're in Job 42, but what is the purpose of man? And this is kind of the, one of the main truths that we keep really um, highlighting and we're, we're being reminded of, and that is to what? To what? glorify God. That's what we're here to do. That's why we're here. That's why we exist, is to glorify God. And so uh, we'll be just briefly be uh, reviewing for a moment. And then we want to kind of try to finish up. Uh, and, and this is just a, kind of an overview of the book of Job and some of the, the, the main truths that stand out to me as I kind of read and look at and study the book of Job. So we'll kind of finish up this morning. Uh, so I hope it, this book has been a blessing. Um, I hope it's an encouragement to you. And uh, hopefully it's answered some questions as well. So why don't we do this? We're going to go to Job chapter 42. And then uh, I want to read a passage to you. And we'll read together. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of review, kind of get caught up to where we are this morning. And then try to do our best uh, to finish this out. But near uh, the last chapter of the book of Job, um, I don't have time to, to read this whole passage, but I may make mention of it in a few moments, but a little bit earlier in this chapter, the Lord speaking to Job, and it says this in Job 42.7, this is where we'll pick up this week, it says, and after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, so the Lord speaks to Job, then notice the Lord's going to speak to Job's friends, remember his buddies, his friends, the Lord is going to speak to his friends, and notice this, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends. Notice what he says. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Job sitting off to the side. I can't help it, but I, I, I wonder if Job, I don't think he did this. But maybe he's like, hey, hey, I was right and you were wrong, you know? Like, nah, 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 you know? See, I told you I was right. He didn't have to because the Lord speaking here. But understand that we, we see just the first two, three chapters is, is talking about Job and what he went through, but then the, the rest of this book are these guys and Job and discourse about, in essence, what God is like, who is God. And then there's a few chapters where God comes in and God speaks and, and God intervenes. And it's interesting because he even speaks about dinosaurs. Like dinosaurs are in the book of Job. And it's a, an amazing book. And there's a lot about science in the book of Job. But more importantly than those type things, we see that God intervenes and he says, you know what, you were misrepresenting me and you were wrong. And you had the wrong view as we studied last week. They had a poor theology. They had a poor view of what God was like. And if we don't have the right view of God, when we're going through suffering, we're going through difficulties, it can either make us or break us. You see, Job had the right view of who God was, and God says, Job was right, and you guys were wrong. And so if we have the wrong view of who God is, when we go through struggle, when we go through difficult times, it can make us or it can break us. You see, in, the, in, the, in Job's eyes, he knew that God was good and that God was love and that God was faithful and that God was still there for him and that the, the God was the one who can give and God can take away. And we're going to see in a moment, God gives, God takes away, but then God gives back. And God was still blessing Job. But Job had the right view of God. His friends had the wrong view of God, and they were misrepresenting God. And boy, notice what happens. God was angry. God was upset. You know, what really is, is something we must be careful of as followers of Jesus Christ, that we do not misrepresent who God is and what God is like. We must really do our best to give people the proper view of who God is. Now notice as we move on. Now therefore... He says to these men, he says, take seven bulls, take seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job, now notice, he doesn't say Job needs to offer up sacrifice. God is upset, God is angry, he says, and there needs to be a sacrifice. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to sacrifice, that the one sacrifice that we needed was the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. And that that sacrifice has been made for us. But in this day, of course, in the days of Job, in the time of the patriarchs, they offered up sacrifice. He said, offer up sacrifice and burnt offerings. But notice what he says, and my servant Job shall pray for you. Man, whew, this is powerful. For I will accept his prayer. 
not deal with you according to your that he that I will not deal with you according to your folly, your foolishness. For you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. There's some strong words here, but he says, you know what? I'm not going to listen to your prayer, but I will listen to Job's prayers. I'm sure his three friends are going, oh, I hope Job is forgiving. Because if Job doesn't offer up prayer for these guys, the Lord is pretty upset. But I, 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 I tell you, Job was a godly man. And we're going to see here that Job did not, he was a forgiving man, and Job did not harbor bitterness. Because notice, it says, So Aliphaz the Temite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and so far the, the uh, Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And notice this, the Lord had accepted Job's prayers. And the Lord restored, notice this, the Lord restored the fortunes, fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. In some version it says this, that the Lord lifted the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. How interesting. And the Lord gave Job, notice this, here's this good God, here's God being faithful. The Lord God gave Job twice as much as he had before. What did he, notice what happens. The Bible says then, uh, is this right? Then came to him all of his brothers and sisters and all that had known him before, uh, before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and they comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Notice this. It's doubled. He had 14,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep. He had 6,000 camels. And in today's, uh, today's uh, uh, realm, it would be something like this, 6,000 semi-trucks, okay? Because these were the, the way they hauled things. So his trucking industry, he had 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen. This is 1,000 tractors. He must have a huge farm, okay? As we move on, notice this. Uh, it says 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. That's, that's transportation, modes of transportation. He had 1,000 vehicles. He had trucks and cars and motorcycles. He probably had a Harley. Who knows? I don't know. But, you know, a thousand of them. Can you imagine this? You know, I mean, God is going to bless this man once again. And notice this. And I think this is really interesting. He also had seven sons. So God blesses him with children again. And notice, in three daughters. And the Bible says, and he called the name of the first daughter Jemima. Um, and from there we get, I think, is that the pancake syrup, isn't there? Aunt Jemima, I'm not sure. Uh, and the name of the second is Kezia. And the name of the third is Karen. We're just calling her Karen because I don't know how to pronounce the rest of it. You guys figure out what, I'm calling her Karen. Can, are, you, are we all okay with that? All right. You didn't even know that that name was in the Bible, right? And it says, in all the land... There were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. And after this, I love this, after this, Job lived 140 years, so God's going to give him a long life, but not only a long life, he's able to see his sons and his son's sons four generations. And I love how the Bible said this, and Job died an old man and full of days, meaning his, he had many days, full of days, uh, and the idea is this, is that he, he lived a prosperous and a healthy life. That he had not just a, 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 a quantity, but he had a quality of life. 140 good years. For a short time, for a season, he went through suffering. But you know something? God was faithful and God blessed him. So let's review real quickly. What is the purpose of man? To do what? To honor and glorify God. To glorify God. We're here to glorify God. But as we study, and the truth that we saw in the book of Job is that there is a plot. The plot of the enemy. And the plot of the enemy is he will stop at nothing to keep us from fulfilling our purpose. And our purpose is to glorify God. But the enemy, the plot is he does not want us to glorify God. He does not want us to make God look good. He does not want us to bring honor and glory to him. So he will attack. And so we see the plot of the enemy as we see uh, Satan comes into the picture. And, and he says that Job only is worshiping God and only glorifying God because God had placed this hedge uh, around him. That God had placed an umbrella of protection over Job. And that Job was only doing it for selfish reasons. That he was only worshiping God 
and glorifying God for his own selfish motives. And he says, if you, if you, you know, if you attack him and if you take these things away, he will curse you to your face. Two times we see that Satan comes and two times the plot of Satan is to try to rob God of the glory that is due him. But Job was faithful. Amen. So we see the plot of Satan. We saw his procedure and how he worked. And how he worked was this. He attacked in a number of ways. And we must be reminded of this. He attacked his finances. And you know the enemy is getting good at what he does. And he will do the same thing. He will try to attack the finances. We saw that he came through tragedy. Through the loss of his children. This is his procedure. Steps that he takes. And he does this over and over and over. It didn't work on Job. But you know there are many people it does work on. And so we must be aware. The Bible says be aware of Satan's tactics, of his schemes, and know that, that realize that he is at work. And, and may I remind all of us that when we're going through suffering, when we're going through difficult times, that it is not God. That we must not blame God. Job's friend said, see, God is doing this to you, Job, because you're evil and you're a hypocrite. And, and they had the wrong view of God. And so we see that he will use tragedy. It may be a death, a death of a loved one. We then see that he will attack health. Sometimes he'll use a season of suffering and, and health. So he will attack our finances. He will attack our health. He will send tragedy. We see here as well that he also will attack through those that we love and through friends and family. We see that he lost the support of his wife. His wife in her grief says, just curse God and die. Just curse God. Just forget it. Just curse God and die. Why, Job, why are you still maintaining your integrity? And then beyond that, his good friends come, right? And when his friends come, they come to comfort him. And after seven days of sitting there and in silence... The Bible says that they begin to speak, and now we have almost pushing 30-some chapters, almost 40 chapters of them literally badgering and attacking Job, attacking his integrity, calling him a hypocrite, saying you're not really a man of God, and then as well trying to tell them what God is like and that God has brought this upon him. Let us be reminded that God is not the author of confusion. Amen. The Bible tells us that, and that God, through his son Jesus, said this, I have come that you may have life, that you may have it more what? Abundantly. The enemy comes, Jesus said the enemy comes to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. And when there's all of these things coming into our life, we have to realize that God is not the enemy, that our family is not the enemy, our friends are not the enemy. And, and there's even times where Jesus had to say to his own disciples, he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. What he was saying is he didn't, he didn't see P Peter as Satan. What he was saying is Satan is using you to try to, to hinder me from doing in fulfilling God's will for my life. And I am here to glorify God. And, and Peter said, no, I will not let you do this. He was trying to stand in the way of what Jesus' purpose was. And then we realize that, again, as Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. What he was saying is, Peter, you're letting the enemy use you. And I, don't, I will not let the enemy use you in my life. So understand that, that the enemy will throw things at us to keep us from glorifying him. And then we saw last week the poor theology of Job's friends. They came to comfort him. They came to encourage him. And after seven days of doing a pretty good job, they opened their mouths. And then they began to say some crazy stuff. But you know, when we think about Job, the Bible says, God said, there is no one as godly as Job. He says, there is no one. Have you seen my servant Job and how he loves me, how he worships me, how he lives for me, he's honoring me, he's glorifying me, and the enemy with his plot tries to, tries to ruin that. Job is a godly man because when I look at what his friends put him through, all the suffering that Job is going through, when God steps in and God intervenes, we don't have time, and I would encourage you to read some of these chapters, but it's interesting because here in chapter 42, a few verses before we read, Job says this, I have heard of you, speaking of, of the Lord God, by the hearing of the ear, but he says, now my eye sees thee, I see you. And he even says, I, I repent. What you, a spirit of humility came over Job. You see, Job was 
not suffering and not going through what he went through because of what he did wrong. He was going through what he went through because he did what he did right. And the enemy tried to disrupt that. The enemy came in to try to rob God of his glory. But you want to know something? Job still did learn and grow through his suffering. And what happened was this. He said, I have heard of you. But he says, because of this suffering, because what I went through, I now see you. I see you more clearly. I know you more deeply. And the Bible says, and it's interesting because we sing the song, I know my Redeemer lives and that I will see him. Do you know who said that? Job did. Somewhere in the middle of the book of Job, as he's in, discour in this discourse with the Lord, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. He says, I know he lives. And he says, and I know that one day I will stand before him and I will see him. As he's in this discourse with his friends, he says, I believe that truth. I believe that promise of God. And now here at the end of the book, understand this. The suffering that Job went through, it brought him closer and it helped him to see God more clearly. Does that make sense? Sometimes when we go through difficult times and we struggle, when we have loss, and when we're suffering, it brings us closer to God. We need Him more, and we get strength from Him, and we don't even know how we're going to do it. We wonder, how am I going to get through this day, or through this week, or through this month? And somehow, by God's grace, we get through it. Amen? And it brings us closer to Him. It brought Job closer to Him. And so it brings us to the last thought, and, and Job is such a godly man because he's still suffering. And while he's suffering, and after his friends have just called him everything they could call him, and low blowed him, and, and just literally just, I mean, I mean, think about this. He's suffering, and all they went through, and he, and he lost his children, and they have no mercy and no sympathy on him. And they call him a hypocrite, and they call him a sinner, and they say that God's angry at you, and all of these things, and they're just, they're judging him, and they're doing these things to Job. When God finally intervenes, and Job says, I see you more clearly. I understand who you are. He's still suffering. The Bible doesn't tell us that his suffering is gone yet. God comes and he says, I want you to pray for your friends. Now, I don't know about you, but with friends like this, who needs enemies, right? <laughs> Let me ask you something. Do you think this would have been a difficult thing after everything that he's been through and the suffering he's in to pray for them? And the Bible says that they, God is angry at his friends. And this shows us the true spirituality of where Job's heart was and the man of God that Job was because he was so quick to forgive his friends. The Lord intervenes and the Lord says to them, I'm angry at you. I mean, we read it twice. He says, I'm angry, I'm upset, and I am not even going to listen to your prayer. I'll listen to Job's prayers and Job will have to pray for your deliverance. And Job, the godly man that he is, prays for them. Could you imagine if maybe he said, oh, I'll think about it, <laughs> you know? He, he just quickly, they bring the burnt offerings, they bring the sacrifice, he sees that God's angry, and he prays for his friends. Here's something else that just hits me. And I don't know if you caught it when you're reading it, and this is just the, hum the humanity that, that, that we all have. But did you notice all of a sudden, when he prays for his friends, he's delivered. Are you with me? He's delivered. He says, the Lord delivered Job when he prayed for his friends. By the way, can I just say this? I think there's a huge application here. A huge application. That bitterness and unforgiveness is a cancer that will eat away at you. And there won't be deliverance until you forgive. And there's not deliverance until, if need be, and how, you say, how do I forgive? One of the best ways you can do that is to pray for your enemies or pray for those who have hurt you. To pray for them. And I think the application here is this is where Job was delivered in many ways. Not just where God said, okay, I'm going to bless you again and give you these things. What if Job, I really believe this, what if Job would not have forgiven his friends and did not pray for them. The Bible tells us he lifted the captivity, that God delivered him after he prayed for his friends. 
by the way, not before. You know, I think a lot of people are in, in bondage and they need deliverance and one of the best things they could do is forgive. Amen? And pray for those who've used us and hurt us. Pray for them. And that is one way that will help you to forgive and bring healing. He was delivered. Bitterness will do more to the vessel in whom it's stored than the victim in whom it's poured. That person goes to bed at night or that individual will go to bed at night and there will be sawing logs and you'll be up dwelling on it and thinking on it and, you know, and, and it will eat away at you. Forgive. Job forgave. He prayed for his friends and God delivered him. The very last thought we've done in just a few moments, and that is this, very simple, the promises of God. The very last truth that I see, and Job even mentions it, he said, I know my Redeemer lives. It didn't look like, <laughs> like it in chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and, and 22 and 23 and 24. But, you know, he said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know God is good. I, I know, I know that, that God is a God of love. And I know that God's not doing this to me. And he, he believed and trusted in what limited promises he had and what he says, I've heard with my ear. And so the things that he had heard, he was holding on to the promises and the truths that were passed down to him. I want you to see the promises of God. And here's just a, few, a, a couple that I think will apply as we look at the book of Job. And that is this. Nothing can happen to you or I without passing through the hands of a loving God. That God is in control and God is sovereign. Nothing God is in control. God is sovereign in our lives. And there's nothing that comes into our life that has not been already approved or allowed by a loving God. Everything that went, Job went through, we see that now God is glorified because of what he went through. What we realize as well is this, is that Job is going to be blessed doubly, and he will be doubly blessed. But beyond that, Job had a greater understanding of God and he said I've heard of what you were like and I and I knew these things but now I clearly see it with my own eyes and Job is going to be blessed when you see here in a moment that he's going to be blessed and 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 he went through that season and I want us to understand that there are times we go through seasons there is seasons of suffering the book of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs says to everything in life there's a song you know to everything in life there is a purpose and there is a season and there's a time to be born and there's a time to die there's a time to, to cry there's a time to laugh and there's a time and a place and, and the Bible says that God has all of these things and allows these things in our life and you know the idea is it's seasoned the season the seasoning of life it seasons us some will say about an athlete he's a seasoned veteran what do they mean by that they've been through the tough they've been through the ups and the downs the wins and the losses and they've been through the overtimes and they've lost and they've won and the idea is this as we walk with God we're going to go through seasons but understand this that when we're in the, that season of time of suffering know that God has a purpose God has a plan nothing happens to us without going through the hands of a loving God who knows us and knows what's best for us. And realize that it is the enemy that brings it into our life. And it's hard for us to comprehend this. But sometimes God allows it. But he has a bigger picture, a bigger plan that is in motion. Are you with me? Because think about this. We're reading and studying about Job today and he brings us encouragement. How many people and how many believers and how many followers has Job, because of his suffering, he didn't realize it. He didn't know. He didn't know when he was going through the suffering and his friends were attacking him. He didn't say, I'm going through all of this because for thousands of years, I'm going to be the encourager of encouragers. I am going to be the example of what it means to suffer and still glorify God. That's going to be me, guys. That's me. He had no clue. 
In fact, honestly, if he was, if he was the one going, if he knew, he would say, Lord, can you please let someone else be that guy? But can I say this? You never know why and what you're going through, but what you're going through, once you get through the other side, you can help other people who are going through the same thing. Are you with me this morning? You can be a blessing and encouragement because you know what it's been like and you know what it's like. Nothing goes to the hands, and nothing happens to us without going through the hands of a loving God. Second promise. God will never test us or try us or put us through something that we cannot handle. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Notice this promise. Now the word, it's an interesting word. It says no temptation. The word temptation is a, a word that can be used both ways. In the Greek, it can be used as to tempt, like to tempt, to sin, but it also means to test or to try. So think about this. In this context, notice we'll use the word testing or to test. He says there is no temptation or no test okay, or testing that is, has overtaken you, that is not common to man, meaning we all struggle, we're all tested, we're all tried, we all go through tribulation, we go through trials. But notice this, here's a, another promise, God is faithful. Is that awesome? Say it with me. God is faithful. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted or he will not let you be tested beyond your ability. But with that temptation or with that testing, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able, that you will be able to endure it. Nothing happens to us without going through the hands of a loving God. But the second promise is this. God will never give us more than we can handle. You want to hear one of the biggest lies? The lies that's been said over and over and over and over again is when people say, you know what, it's just more more than I can handle. I was given more. I just couldn't do it. It's more than I can handle. Not true. I know we don't want to believe that, but that is not a truthful statement. That is a lie of the enemy. And the enemy is saying, you can't, you can't handle this. Just quit. Just give up. But God will never give us more. Is it in the Bible? Is it there? Is it a promise from God that he will not give us more than we are able to bear? God knows you. He knows all about you. He says, I know the hairs on your head. He says, I know everything about you. He knows the sparrow that falls. And the Lord Jesus said this. He says, I know all about you, everything about you. I know what you can handle and what you can't handle. And he says, I will not, I promise you. He says, God's saying, my children, I promise you, I will not. I will not push you beyond the limits. I will bring you as close to the limits and I will put you through a lot and allow it, but I will never do something that will cause you to break. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to me. Have you ever been at the end of your rope and found out that there's more rope? <laughs> Are you right? Like, Lord, I just can't handle any more. If there's just any more, and all of a sudden, you're like, you go down a few more inches, you know, Lord, I'm at the end of my rope, and you're still not at the knot at the bottom of the rope. Are you with me? Have you ever been there, done that? Lord, I'm at the end of my, I just can't do it. <laughs> I've been there, done that. And Lord, I just, I just can't take it. And then there's more. And you're like, well, Lord, there's more. And the Lord just keeps stretching us and stretching us and stretching us. And you know, it's the same, you know, when you're a coach, you'll do that to guys. And you're like, just one more. Just, I can't. I can't. Coach, I can't do it. Yes, you can. I know you can. Just one. And they'll do it. I'm like, see, I told you you can do one more. Yeah, but my spleen is now gone. <laughs> I can't walk for three weeks, but you did it! Yeah! PR, personal best. Five more pounds, ten more pounds, one more rep. And, the, you know, but the point is, so many times we say, I can't do this, but God is stretching us, and God will not give us more than we can handle. And he always provides a way. When we're in temptation, we don't have to sin and give into it. He provides a way of escape. Amen. When we're in testing and trial, 
He will not overload us. He will not break us. He is a loving God that will not give us more than we can handle. And sometimes we don't see it like this, but you know, think about this. Job was tested. Job went through this. And he passed the test. Job probably never dreamed that he could go through all that he went through and pass the test. I think about another man who was tested in the Old Testament. Leading up, Job leading up to the time, you know, when we think of the patriarchs, you have Abraham, and Job lived between Abraham and Moses before the giving of the law. Maybe it's possible that Job thought of a man who was tested and tried, a man named Abraham, who's told to take his one and only son Isaac, to take him to a mountain which ended up being Mount Moriah, the very place where our Lord, near where our Lord was crucified. And God told Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your one and only son Isaac, the one with whom the promise the promise of a coming nation. I want you to take him and I want you to take him up on top of the mountain and offer him up as a sacrifice. Abraham is a very old man, upwards of 100 years of age. Isaac is, from what I study, in his, around 20 some years of age, in his 20s. Isaac very easily could have overpowered his father and as they're carrying the load, the Bible says that Isaac is carrying the wood for the sacrifice. Hmm. What a few beautiful picture of Jesus Christ carrying the wooden cross up the Mount of Golgotha. Abraham the father, Isaac the one and only son. The whole beautiful picture of salvation and a picture of the gospel. God the father and his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Isaac, as he's walking with his father, he says, Father, I see the, I see the knife, and I see the wood, I see the, the offering, but where, where, is, where is the sacrifice? Abraham knows that God has asked him to sacrifice his own son on that altar. And Abraham says this, Son, listen to prophecy here. Oh, it's beautiful. Son, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice, himself a lamb. The prophecy there is beautiful. He will provide himself. Whew. Abraham didn't even realize what he was saying. He didn't have the heart to tell his son that he is going to be, he is going to be the sacrifice. The Bible says that Abraham in the book of Hebrews by faith believed and trusted God and that he went through that trial. He believed that God would bring his son back to life. That if he were to sacrifice his son, he was going to have to shed his blood. He was going to cut his son's throat. We can't even fathom this and place him on an altar and burn him as a sacrifice before God to please God. And we know how, again, God will never give us more than we can handle. Amen. And as Abraham takes his son, his son, we see the obedience of his son. He could have fought his father off, and he doesn't. He willingly lays himself there on that altar, trusting his father, trusting, think about this, trusting his father. What would possess a 20-some-year-old man to trust his father the way he trusted his father? You know what it was? He knew his father loved him. And he knew his father knew what was best for him. Isaac lays himself down willingly on that altar. By the way, Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross. Trusting that the father knew what was best. That God would not give him more than he could bear. Amen? As he prayed in the garden... Jesus said this, Lord, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, let this cup of suffering, let this cup pass from me. But he says, not my will, 
but your will be done. Do you see that? God, you know what's best. You will, you will give me the strength. You, will, what you know what I can handle and what I can't handle. And so Abraham, as he's there about to offer his son as a sacrifice, and he takes up the knife to take his own son's life. Oh, how beautiful this is. God intervenes and God steps in and says, No, Abraham, look, I've provided a ram in the thicket. Take him and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham, you've passed the test. You've passed the test. Maybe Job looked at the example of Abraham. And as he's going through this test, in this trial, in this suffering, he knew this reality, he knew this truth, that God will not give him more than he can bear. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a loving Father. Trust him and know that God will not give us more that we can handle. And I finish with this one, this last promise that we see that Job was holding and clinging to. And we see in the book of Job, and what we see here in this last chapter is that God is faithful. Amen. God provided that ram for Abraham. God is going to provide once again. He intervenes. The Bible says he blesses Job with twice as much. Job was steadfast. Job was able to pass the test. And because Job was faithful, God was faithful to Job. Amen. And he blesses him. He gives him twice as much. He has twice the land and twice the farm and twice the, and then all of his family and friends, everyone, where were they when he was broke? Where were they? They all start showing up. And you know what? Better late than never. They all start showing up and they start bringing him gold and bringing him rings and they come and they sympathize with him and they rejoice with him as well. He's blessed with children and with beautiful daughters. And we see that he's been given, he was given 140 more years of a good life. And we see God blessing him once again. One last passage and we're finished. Let's just read this out of James because the book of James tells us and uses Job as an example. He says, you also, speaking to you and I, brothers and sisters, we finish with this. Be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. About, it's almost time. The Lord's coming. It's near, okay? So hold on. Hold. Be steadfast. Be faithful. It says, don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. The Lord is near. He's close. His coming is near. But notice, he's, he's here. He's going to deliver us. He says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets which spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Now notice this. Here's the example. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let me encourage you with this. Be faithful through trial. Be faithful through testing. Because you want to know something? God is faithful. Amen? And he says, be steadfast. But he says, look at the example. So thousands of years later, James, as he's speaking to the church, the, and this, the, it says the, in James 1, it says, to those who are scattered abroad, to those who are suffering for the name of Christ, he uses this at the end, his last chapter, he uses Job as the example. And you know something? Thousands of years later, as we read the scriptures, we use Job as an example of one who was steadfast, one who was faithful, one who didn't quit, one who passed the test of adversity and passed the test. And when you're in that season of suffering, realize this, cling to the promises of God, that although it does not look like it, but God sees and God knows and that God is in control. And brothers and sisters, I encourage you with these words that God is faithful. And at any moment, he's at the door. Do you get that picture? James says he's at the door. He's, he's near. He's close. His coming is near. And what we have to understand is that you can apply it both ways. That yes, the Lord is coming back. You might, I really believe this. What he's saying is at any moment, the Lord can come in and he can take care of things. Job was in this place of complete, utter despair. And 
all of a sudden, within moments, God intervenes, and his, his health is restored. He's been given a family. His wealth is restored, and Job is blessed, and he has 140 good years. I, I'd take 14 good years, amen? 140 good years. It says he lived a long life. He saw his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren. He had good health. And he had a good life. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. Be steadfast when you're going through those seasons. Amen? Because God is faithful. Cling to the promises of God. I love this. God cannot lie. It doesn't say that God does not lie. The Bible tells us this, that God cannot lie. People may give us their word and people may make promises and there's times they let us down but may, may I encourage you with this God will never let us down God keeps his word amen God is faithful be faithful be steadfast always abounding in the work Lord for your labor is not in vain in the Lord and all God's people said this morning amen let's have a word of prayer we'll stand together and have a word of prayer Lord, I pray you'd bless your word. We thank you for Job. Help us to be like Job. Help us.